So without further ado, let's get this thing done. E to the i pi equals negative one. Welcome to a video I have been waiting ages to do, explaining e to the i pi plus one equals zero. Often called Euler's identity or Euler's formula, always called the most beautiful formula in all of mathematics. Euler's identity is so surprising because it brings together mathematical constants and operations from all kinds of different fields, all kinds of different mathematical developments into this one beautiful formula. One, of course, inaugurates the number system. That's where we start our counting numbers or natural numbers. The recognition of zero, both as a number and then even more importantly, later on as a digit was huge for mathematical development. And then of course, e, i, and pi all represent different fields of math mathematics. Pi gives us that connection between a circle's diameter and its circumference, but really it becomes the source of all of our angles and then trigonometry and things that we can do with polygons. I is this special number that gives meaning to previously unsolvable algebraic equations like x squared plus one. And then finally, E of course comes to us from the world of calculus or analysis, looking at limiting processes. The key thing to recognize is none of these areas are particularly related. We wouldn't expect there to be any kind of special connection between them. And yet when we raise e to some kind of strange geometrically imaginary power, it gives us back a value, negative one, that when we add to one cancels out and makes zero. In fact, that's probably the first thing worth doing here. Although the one and the zero in the presence of this identity are nice, strictly speaking, they're not really necessary. What's actually going on here is e to the i pi equals negative one. And if you ignore e's weirdness for just a second, if you just think of it as a number a little smaller than three, this is really weird where the strange thing is going on. How is it that we can exponentiate a number a little bit smaller than three, raise it to some power, multiply by it over and over again, or even divide by it over and over again, and end up with a negative number at the end of that process? If you repeatedly multiply by three, you're just gonna get larger and larger numbers. If you repeatedly divide by three, you'll get smaller and smaller numbers, but these numbers remain positive the entire time. We can see this in the typical picture for the e to the x curve. It starts, like most exponential curves, at 0, 1. And again, if you think of e as just a little smaller than 3, as we repeatedly multiply by e, our values get much, much larger. Or for that matter, as we repeatedly divide by e, our values get smaller, but they never cross below the x-axis. They shouldn't become negative. Unless, that is, we can bring in something like the imaginary unit. Again, the imaginary number is the number that gives us solutions to equations like x squared plus 1 equals 0. Because what we're saying is there must be some square that equals equals negative one. Generally speaking, of course, this does not happen. When you square positive numbers, you get back more positive numbers. When you square negative numbers, you also get back more positive numbers. It's only when you square imaginary numbers, this other axis. If we think of our basic real number line going left to right, our imaginary number line instead goes perpendicular to that number line, of course, beginning at the origin, zero comma zero. And with that kind of number, we can raise something to a second power and end up with a negative result. Similarly, on our exponential curve, if we extend it to the complex plane, there are ways to think about e being raised to some power and giving you back a negative value that start to make sense. In fact, that's what gives us our entry into trying to understand what e to the i pi equals negative one could possibly mean. We are going to situate a triangle in complex space. So this left to right axis is indeed our real axis, but the up and down axis now represents the imaginary numbers. So if I had a point in this plane, one comma pi, that actually represents represents the complex number one plus pi i. Now what I'm gonna do next is I'm gonna take the height of that triangle, again, the height being the imaginary part, and I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. I'm actually gonna take a smaller and smaller chunk of the pi i, and then I'm gonna represent another similar triangle drawn on top of that previous triangle. So for this picture where n equals two, I have divided my height into two, and so the height now is pi i over two. The base, of course, is still one, and then the hypotenuse would be whatever it is in complex space. But this vertex right here now represents the complex number one plus pi i over two. When we draw in this similar triangle here, this vertex, the rotation of the original vertex, represents the complex number one plus pi i over two squared. If we worked out that value, we would have some real part and some imaginary part. You can ignore this for just a second because it looks like this would have like real part, roughly negative 1.5, 
5, and then imaginary part something like 2-ish. E represents an exponentiating process. And so what we want to do is actually perform these triangles, coming up with more and more similar triangles, over and over and over again. For any given n, we are just letting our base stay 1 and our height be pi i divided by that number. And so then we're going to multiply through that number of vertices. In this case, you can see we're going to go 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to five different vertices. Meaning this vertex over here represents the complex number one plus pi i over five raised to the fifth power. If this is giving you flashbacks to E's definition itself, good, because that's exactly what's going on. E to the x is defined as the limit as one plus that number x gets divided into smaller and smaller portions, but then that sum raised to the power of the number of portions. In mathematical symbols, we call that the limit as n goes to infinity of one plus x over n raised to the nth power. Typically, we let x be some whole number, like one for example, and then we divide one into smaller and smaller bits, but then we multiply over and over again that number of times, that n number of times. As we do this for something like one, you can see that the number we get gets closer and closer to 2.7, etc. That is, it gets closer to e. If we let the thing we are dividing into smaller and smaller parts be two, as I've changed it to here, then as we increase the number of parts, you can see we get closer and closer to 7.389, etc., etc. That is, we get closer and closer to e squared. The key for understanding e to the i pi equals negative one is that x does not have to be a real number. It can just as easily be an imaginary number like pi i. So this gets us to where we need to be back in the complex plane where we're doing the triangle thing. As we split pi i into smaller and smaller bits, but then we multiply that number of times. If we split it into four parts, we multiply four times. We draw four of these similar triangles. Letting n increase toward infinity is going to get us that definition of e that we need, and so it's going to give us a value for the expression e to the pi i. And so this little toy in Desmos is literally showing us the limiting process that helps us figure out the value for e to the i pi. And you can see here, here it is, here it comes. As we let n increase, 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 get as large as we want, the value, that final vertex, gets closer and closer to negative one on our real axis. It's the end result of, in this case, 9,550 similar triangles, all with a height in the complex plane of pi i over 9,550. And you can see in this particular case, it gets us very, very close to negative one, negative 1.001. But the key is we don't actually stop at n equals 9,550. We imagine n going to literally infinity, getting as large as you want. And when that happens, we're left with basically a perfect semicircle in complex space. And that semicircle has a final vertex on the left at negative one. If you wanna play around with this Desmos graph, this was the big thing that I was super excited about and I would love for you to take a look at it. You can find it, I'll put the link up here, bit.ly slash e to the i pi Desmos. I'm pretty sure that's what it is, but it'll be in writing there. I'll also put the link down in the description. Credit where due, I actually saw this proof originally in an article by Carlo Salucci and I loved it, but again, what I'm super excited about today is having been able to develop a picture of that proof that you can play around with in Desmos. So please go check out that graph. Like the video if this has been interesting. I try to do this kind of thing. There are a couple steps I skipped in this particular proof. For example, you might wonder these similar triangles as we do them, how come they don't just rotate infinitely around the complex plane? Why is it that they actually stop as we take one half turn through the complex plane? It has to do with a particular limit called the limit as n goes to infinity of n times the inverse tangent of pi over n. You can check that video out either in a corner up here or down here in the description. And then why, of course, does the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n raised to the n power, why does that converge toward e? I also did a video on that last week. So a couple key steps that I skipped over in today's video. Be sure to check those out if you're interested. Like and subscribe, and otherwise I'll see y'all next time.